Hello and welcome to the statewide staff meeting on the Modern Languages K-10 syllabus. Is my volume OK there, Evia? Great. Yep. All Thank good. you. During this meeting, we will provide an introduction to the syllabus and our support. I am Renetta Wolf, and I'm presenting today. My colleagues Chanel Ingram and Victoria Hay will be monitoring the chat pod and adding important links for you. And before I get right into it, is uh, Valerie on the call? Is Valerie there? Yes, I am. Hi, Valerie. So everybody, this is our new member of the Languages and Culture team, Valerie Wang. Did you want to say hi or introduce yourself? Hello. Hi, everyone. My name's Valerie. Nice to meet you all. I think I've met some of you already um, in the Sydney Southwest Network meeting as well. So I guess in this space, I'm happy to be working with all of you. Thanks, Valerie. It's wonderful to have you on our team. Thank you. So we recognise the ongoing custodians of the lands and waterways where we work and live. We pay respect to elders past and present as ongoing teachers of knowledge, songlines and stories. We strive to ensure every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander learner in New South Wales achieves their potential through education. This image from last year's Calendar for Cultural Diversity um, is something I've chosen for this presentation. It's the calendar itself uh, promotes intercultural understanding, cultural and linguistic diversity, community harmony and social inclusion across New South Wales public schools and their communities. The artwork is called Wambuani Sunset and it's by Angela Dee, who is a year, was it last year, a year eight student at Karen School here in Bathurst on Wiradjuri country. I often see around Mount Panorama, the mob of kangaroos, and she said her artwork is of a Wambawani, which is the Wiradjuri name for kangaroo, and that sometimes she and her school friends see a mob of Wambawani near their school, which is near Walu, Mount Panorama, Bathurst. So it's one of my favourite pictures to use in our acknowledgements of country. In our meeting today, we want to reassure you that the Languages and Culture team is here to help you understand and use the new syllabus with implementation of the new curriculum using the syllabus in the beginning of next year, 2024. First, we will revise key features of the new syllabus as this is an exciting development for language teaching and learning. Next, we will share our thinking behind the scope and sequence documents that we have created for you to start your planning journey with something tangible to follow and consider. Then we will outline how we have adjusted an existing unit of work and added resources that you can use part of or all of uh, with your students. Next, we'll outline what other support we have published or will publish later this year. And we'll conclude by taking any questions that you may have uh, at the end of this and we'll stop recording for those questions. Please remember that our resources are not prescribed. They are support documents aimed at supporting all teachers of modern languages across New South Wales. Teachers will need to adjust them to suit their own context, including the needs of their students. So let's start with a syllabus overview. I think Victoria will help us out here within the chat as need, needed. There are many things about the new syllabus that are similar to our current language specific K-10 syllabuses, which means we don't need to start from scratch when we program. However, we do need to refine our teaching, learning and assessment activities to align with the new outcomes and content. And having explored the new syllabus in detail, our team is genuinely excited about the changes. We summarised everything in this infographic in our statewide staff room, which we're sure you've already seen. Victoria is going to add it though to the chat so that you can take a detailed look later if this is the first time you've seen it. So, to break it down a little, there's one syllabus for all modern languages. The same outcomes and content will make collaborative planning easier for teachers. 
there is a stronger focus on students and their personal world. The central goal is communicating in the target language, exposing students to as much of the target language as possible and encouraging them to use it as a medium in the classroom as they progress. Culture cannot be taught in isolation from the language. The syllabus emphasises using and understanding culturally appropriate target language. There are just three outcomes per stage instead of the eight or nine that we currently have. For each stage, there are outcomes for interacting, understanding texts and creating texts. Students apply knowledge of language systems and develop intercultural capability through all the outcomes. For all stages, interacting is primarily done through oral language and extends to socialising in stages four and five. It's about spontaneous exchanges, so we need to provide our students with as much comprehensible target language input and scaffolds to help them build towards spontaneity. There are three proficiency levels, beginner, intermediate and advanced, with examples for each. It's more supportive of students with disability, Language skills and literacy are more explicit in the content. Outcomes and content for stage five allow for clearer progress progression into stage six. And it includes teaching advice linked to each outcome and stage. It's also a digital syllabus, which will allow you to choose what you want on the screen or what you want to print for ease of programming. The digital syllabus also included teaching advice linked to, includes teaching advice linked to each outcome. To find out how to access and use the digital syllabus, you can view our how-to videos. You can find these on the Languages New South Wales YouTube channel. And again, Victoria is going to add that link to the chat for us. And Renette, well, I'll just say that to everyone that the infographics just a little bit further up, people were just posting their welcome. Yep. messages such as a bit further up. Thank you. So like our current syllabuses, teachers continue to make decisions about the sequence and emphasis given to the content based on the needs of their students, of your students. Now this diagram shows how the modern languages K-10 syllabus is organised, the new syllabus. The central goal, as we commented before, is communication in the target language, and this is shown in the red line, by the red line. The syllabus has three focus areas, interacting, understanding texts, and creating texts. Each focus area has its own related outcomes for each stage. Applying knowledge of language systems and developing intercultural capability span all three focus areas. This means that students are expected to use and understand culturally appropriate target language across K to 10. So I'll just note here too that we say focus areas, but you'll notice that they're also the same as three outcomes. So under each focus area, we also have the same thing as an outcome, interacting, understanding texts, creating texts. So here are the outcomes for stage four, stage five, and for life skills in stages four and five. So you can see each outcome has a code, which is the same as they currently do. But because there's only one in each focus area, each of our outcomes ends in a zero one. So let's take a look at the syllabus structure at the outcome and content level. This is a screenshot of stage four interacting. As you can see, the name of the focus area is on the top of the page in the dark blue box. In this case, interacting. Right underneath is the outcome code, ML4INT01, and then the outcome, which is exchanges information and opinions in a range of familiar contexts by using culturally appropriate language. The subheadings on the right hand side show the content organised into content groups. Now the first content group 
shows the communication skills and functions by which students will learn in order to demonstrate achievement of the outcome. The second content group contains the knowledge of language systems students will develop. And finally, the third group is about applying knowledge of the target language culture. So it's important to remember that in order to do one, the communication skills students need two, and in order to do it in a culturally appropriate way, they need three. One of the main differences in the new syllabus is the interacting focus area and its related outcomes. We believe that the understanding texts and creating text outcomes and content will obviously still have need analysis and consideration, but these are probably more familiar to you than the interacting outcomes and content. So let's just take a moment to talk about interacting. To recap, if you have already seen it or haven't, our term one statewide staff meeting with Professor Florencia Henshaw, we gave a presentation about second language acquisition theory through an interacting focus. If you missed it, you can catch up via our YouTube channel. But here is a brief recap of how interacting is different in the new modern languages K-10 syllabus. Firstly, interacting requires students to communicate with each other. It is primarily done through oral language. It must be reciprocal. It is spontaneous. And in stages four and five, it ex extends to socialising. So when you review our units of work, you'll see that we have made every effort to embed these aspects, or we have embedded these aspects of interacting. All right, so that was an overview of the um, syllabus, which I think we have presented before, but we, since it's new, we like to recap now, understanding what is new in the syllabus and how the syllabus is structured will assist you in programming. To support you with programming, we are developing a suite of resources, which will be released over the next 12 months. And let's start with our scope and sequence documents, which were uploaded in term one. Planning for the new K-10 syllabus allows us to revisit and think carefully about the purpose of a scope and sequence in our teaching program. A scope and sequence summarises what is to be taught and the sequence in which it will be taught within a year or stage. For example, you may have one unit for each term of learning which looks at a particular theme or topic. Although in our new syllabus sample scope and sequences, we have arranged the elements differently to the current syllabus ones, the elements required for a scope and sequence as such have not changed. You do need to ensure, of course, you are using the new outcomes in your scope and sequence. Let's now look at a sample scope and sequence for the new syllabus. This is term one from the sample stage four 100 hours generic scope and sequence available on our website. We'll put the link in the chat for you now. Thank you, Victoria. And on this scope and sequence, you can see Nessa's requirements for what is to be included. The title of each unit, the sequence of each unit for the year or stage, the duration of each unit, and the syllabus outcomes included in each, out, in each unit as outcome codes. Whilst not required by Nessa for school registration, the department recommends including the following in your scope and sequence for each unit. The skills students will develop, a short description of the summative assessment task, and a learning overview of each unit. 
These inclusions support a backward mapping approach and provide a succinct reminder of what skills are important for students to successfully demonstrate achievement of the outcomes and content in the context of the unit. A scope and sequence provides a summary of what will be taught over the stage or year. Our sample generic stage four scope and sequence is for a 100 hours course over one year, which is usually in year seven or year eight, with one unit per term, as you can see. One unit per term. So let's just look closely at term two of the stage four generic scope and sequence. With only three outcomes per stage, all units on your scope and sequence should address all outcomes. However, when designing your summative assessment task for each unit, avoid targeting the same outcomes and content each time. By assessing all outcomes and a range of their related content across a year or stage, you are allowing opportunities for students to demonstrate their achievement more broadly. In a scope and sequence, you should provide the outcome or outcomes addressed in the summative assessment task, in this case, interacting, and an overview of what is required for the task. This slide shows the assessment tasks for all four units from the same scope and sequence. As you can see, the three outcomes have been addressed through the assessment tasks. The task we just looked at in term two assesses interacting. In term one, creating texts and understanding texts are assessed. In term three, creating texts is assessed. And term four, understanding texts and interacting are assessed. One of the features of the new syllabus is that the outcomes and content allow for clearer progression into stage six. Due to internal assessments requirements for stage six, teachers need to create tasks which assess students in a variety of ways building a more complete picture of a student's overall achievement. An example of this is an interrelated task where two or more skills are assessed within one task. The content from the text in one component of the task influences the receptive skills of the student and influences their productive responses. So you can see in term one and term four, this approach has been taken for the assessment tasks. As long as all outcomes are assessed across the stage or year, it is up to the teacher as to which they choose to assess for each unit. As I mentioned previously, a backward mapping approach to planning each unit is best practice with the summative assessment task used to determine what content and teaching activities are included in the unit of work. When designing your scope and sequence, we recommend that you embed the spiral approach. The acquisition of a language is a cumulative process. Therefore, a continuous and sequenced approach is essential when developing your units of work. Using a spiral approach gives students the chance to revisit what they have learned and use their language skills to participate in more complex situations. Students can develop their skills gradually and repeatedly, reinforcing and growing vocabulary and structures over time. As a result, students' knowledge is deepened and broadened and they experience a feeling of success by building on prior learning. Here I will show you an example of how we have embedded the spiral approach in our generic scope and sequences for stage four, 100 hours, and stage five, 200 hours, which is year nine and 10. In stage four, in term one, the topic is my selfie, and students learn to introduce themselves and exchange information about age, birthday, where they live, their likes and dislikes. 
They learn greetings and describe physical appearance. Then in year nine in term three, the related topic is who are your influences? Students learn to describe people in more depth in the context of how people have influenced them. They discuss personality and feelings and justify their connections with people. Here, the content of the topic My Selfie is revisited and developed in more depth and provides students with the opportunity to build on and enhance their skills within a similar topic. Then in year 10 in term two, the related topic is hopes and dreams. In this topic, students discuss their personal world in the context of their abilities, subject choice, choices, and hopes for the future. Again, this content circles back to the content in my selfie and who are your influences. But their knowledge and skills are deepened, broadened and strengthened. The spiral approach of revisiting content and gradually building student skills allows them to build their communicative competence and confidence to use the target language in real life situations. We also recommend providing a student friendly copy of the scope and sequence to students at the start of the year, written and presented in a way appropriate to them. This gives students a sense of what they may be able to achieve by the end of each year or stage, which can be very motivating. Students will also be able to see how all their learning links and builds, enhancing engagement and supporting students to reflect on areas of growth or for growth. This is a student friendly copy of the generic scope and sequence for modern languages stage for 100 hours. So please take a moment to read through it. This is for the year nine of the generic scope and sequence for the modern languages, stage five, 200 hours course. I'll let you read that one. And this is for year 10. I'll give you another moment to read it. Okay, next, let's look at how we are setting out our units of work. We are creating two units of work per language. So these, we, they won't be generic yet. Those scope and sequences were generic and there will be scope and sequences for each language as well. One unit of work for stage four and one for stage five including relevant resources for teaching and learning activities. So the French and Japanese units are scheduled to be published on our website by the end of term, with other languages following in semester two to 2023 and in 2024. You may have noticed we've advertised for teacher writers to support us with this work, and this ensures our support is developed by practicing teachers. Units of work summarise the teaching and learning activities, resources and assessment, both formative and summative, for a particular set of outcomes and content in the syllabus. They also include adjustments to meet the learning needs of students where required and a section for reflection and evaluation. Here is the title and contents pages of our stage four Japanese unit of work for the new syllabus. Our units deliberately contain details which unpack new information and pedagogy in order to cater for a statewide audience and meet departmental publishing requirements. Your units are not expected to reflect this level of detail. So Nessa requires that a unit of work includes a unit description, syllabus outcomes, duration, year or stage, integrated teaching and learning activities, 
reflection and evaluation. NESA also requires differentiation, catering to the range of student abilities and interests in your class, opportunities to collect evidence of student achievement, subject specific requirements where relevant, resources and adjustments for students with disability where appropriate. So as we move through the presentation today, you'll see that we've added mini task checkpoints. And we've included links to resources and other suggestions for differentiation and adjustments at various times throughout the teaching and learning activities. As you can see from this, we have more information in a unit of work than is required by NESA. However, we include this extra information to help your teaching, to inspire ideas and promote best practice across all schools. Please remember that the units are not created for you to teach exactly as they are, but are to there, there to inspire you and to support you to create your own units or adjust your existing units of work to suit your own context and students. Of course, though, if the unit works for you and then you are more than welcome to use it as it is. While not required by NESA, again, for school registration, the department does recommend designing your summative assessment task first and then backward mapping your unit, including your teaching and learning activities and formative assessment opportunities for students. The new units of work similar to our current units include this information in the opening pages. So you can see the suggested end of unit summative task here in the opening pages of the unit of work document. The most significant change we have made to our units of work is that they are arranged into chunks or sequences of learning and no longer in one long table. Each unit of work is split into three or four of these learning sequences and each sequence begins with a small table for learning intentions and success criteria and ends with a mini task progress checkpoint. Each of the learning sequences started, starts with an estimated duration and topic area. This provides more flexibility for adaptation to various school contexts. So for, today, for today's example, we have called this learning sequence describing my pet. This would represent about a third of a whole terms unit of work. Breaking the unit into a few sequences of teaching and learning activities in this way means that setting the learning intentions and success criteria for a few weeks of learning is more explicit and more relevant and more engaging for students. Similarly, breaking the suggested vocabulary and grammar into a three or four week focus instead of a list for a whole term is also more user friendly. The learning sequence then has two to three learning focus sections, depending on the number of weeks suggested, that explain the skills, language and cultural aspects required to build towards achieving the outcomes of the summative task at the end of the unit. Also here at the end of each teaching and learning dot point, we have included the suggestion to include the most relevant content dot point from the syllabus. While other syllabus content dot points may be relevant, we've focused on the one with the strongest alignment to ensure we are covering the full range of syllabus content. Each learning sequence then concludes with a mini task, progress checkpoint. If we stick with the pets example, this mini task progress checkpoint could be to read advertisements on an animal shelter website and answer questions. Hypothetically, the summative task for this unit could be to create a series of social media posts to help pets find their forever homes. And so in this mini task, students are required to understand something similar and are learning about the relevant vocabulary, grammatical structures and text types. 
It's not the same as the end of unit task, but it has an obvious and relevant connection. The mini task also enables students and teachers to assess progress towards the final summative task or end of unit assessment and for the teacher to provide feedback. We think these sequences of learning make the unit of work more user friendly. You may, choo to you may choose to use the unit as is or adapt it. Or maybe you'll find one learning sequence perfectly suited to your context, but not the rest of the unit of work. Our goal is to showcase planning and pedagogy to support student success. Looking more closely now at suggested teaching and learning activities, you'll see in this snapshot they are in dot point form under each learning focus heading. You can also see many resources are still included as hyperlinks, like our current units of work. The main thing to notice here is that content dot points from the syllabus are now added in bold at the end of every activity. As I mentioned, we have chosen the one most relevant to the task, but multiple could be included if you consider them appropriate. Now let's look more closely at what we have called a mini task. Basically, they are tasks or progress checkpoints that have been backward mapped from the end of unit summative task. Each unit has two or three mini task checkpoints included at the end of each learning sequence. By including them in our units of work, it embeds an opportunity for formative assessment, student reflection, feedback, and teacher evaluation while the learning is in progress and not just at the end. Now we know that teachers are always providing feedback and always formatively assessing students, but this approach now allows you to clearly define that process and explicitly link it to the summative assessment task. Furthermore, it allows students to be engaged with and involved in their learning journey and to identify their individual learning goals. So in the grey shaded area there, you'll find suggested adjustments for differentiation. And just like in the teaching and learning activity dot points, there are hyperlinks to included resources. The example shown here is to support stage four students in their preparation for an end of unit task that has an interacting component. So the resources provided for this task support students to develop their interacting skills. The interaction has information gaps in that they don't know what event their partner wants to attend and spontaneity in the conversation fillers and comment making. There is a real world purpose and context to the task to make arrangements and socialise with peers. Resources to support students in their thinking are also included. And as you may remember from the slide outlining the learning sequences, student and teacher reflections have also been included after each mini task to inform practice and help students connect with their learning. Lastly, to complement our units of work, we will also be sharing student friendly unit overviews or learning maps. These are a great visual representation of the learning for students. And here is the stage four Japanese. And this fun one, here is the stage five Japanese, which I'll give you a moment to read through before I move to the next slide. So now let's take a look at the current and future support we have planned for you all. You may have noticed our website looks different. The entire department website is moving to a new platform and so there's a lot of changes happening. Work is ongoing on our section so things are moving around. If you cannot find something please let us know and we'll send it to you directly. 
This is our landing page to access support for the Modern Languages K-10 syllabus. Click on Planning, Programming and Assessing Languages 7 to 10. And on the Planning, Program and Assessing 7 to 10 page, you'll see a section for the Modern Languages K-10 syllabus. On this page, you'll find the scope and sequences we've looked at today and our new programming guidelines document. Included in this document are checklists, including a scope and sequence checklist and a unit of work checklist. These support you to include all the NESA requirements as well as our recommendations that we've talked about today. The unit of work checklist, as I said, also includes requirements to support you to demonstrate quality teaching and learning in your units. So opportunities to ascertain students' prior knowledge, communication as the central goal, opportunities for students to develop knowledge of language systems, including sounds, vocabulary, grammar, and where required script, opportunities to develop intercultural capability by using culturally appropriate language, a good balance of the macro skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, learning intentions and success criteria for each sequence of learning within the unit, supporting student engagement and success, and opportunities for feedback and student reflection for deeper understanding and identification of individual learning goals. Depending on the availability of teacher writers, we're planning to roll out modern languages support over 12 to 18 months. You can see what's available here already. We've looked at the scope and sequences and programming guidelines. Please note that if you're a teacher who leads a languages faculty or if you're the only teacher in your faculty, we also recommend reading our leading languages 7 to 12 document, which has been updated to support the new syllabus. So this is what's planned for this term. I'll let you read that. And this is what we have in the pipeline. Indonesian, modern Greek, Korean and Arabic will be published in 2024, sub subject to availability of writers. And remember, a lot of our support is also rolling out through our 19 networks. If you're not a member, please contact your local network leader. And Victoria is going to add the link to the contacts to the chat. And we'd also love to hear what other support you'd like. So feel free to drop it in the chat or contact us via the statewide staff room or blog. And this is a list of other professional learning we have available. Our statewide staff meetings, as you know, because you're here, are held in week four of each term. And our network meetings are in week seven or eight. We also organise language specific conferences, some in, some in collaboration with stakeholders. All these events are advertised in the statewide staff room and on the blog. You can see we also have a range of accredited professional or PD available. Once again, details are in the staff room. Finally, here is a list of useful links to help with your planning. This is the link to the digital syllabus. Remember that NESA also has accredited PD course for the new syllabus. And here is the Languages New South Wales YouTube channel with links to the Term 1 meeting and also our how-to videos for navigating the syllabus. So thank you for joining us today. That concludes our presentation.
little bit early for you all. Um, I'll, I think Evia will stop the recording here for us. If anyone has would like to unmute themselves or turn their